Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for your presence here today to a special lecture program by the former Prime Minister of Great Britain, Lady Margaret Thatcher. My name is Yuko Yamaguchi, and it's my honor to be the master of ceremonies for today's program. Now, we would like to welcome the special speaker of this morning, Lady Margaret Thatcher. We would like to begin this lecture program with a few words from President of Hello Guide Academy, Mr. Genichiro Uyama. Lady Thatcher, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor and pleasure to welcome Lady Thatcher as an honorary advisor to Hello Guide Academy and to hold this commemorative lecture meeting here today. As I am sure you have already learned, the government of Japan last Wednesday conferred the grand cordon of the precious crown on Lady Thatcher for her contributions to Japanese-British relations. On behalf of Hello Guide Academy, I'd like to express our congratulations to Lady Thatcher for this singular honor which she so deserves. With this wonderful news, we are even more honored to be holding this, our third lecture meeting with Lady Thatcher as speaker. And very appropriately, she will be addressing us today on how to communicate Japanese culture to the rest of the world. I sincerely hope that this lecture will have a special value for all of you here today who play leading roles in international and intercultural exchanges. And now I'd like to present one of the greatest political leaders of this century, ladies and gentlemen, Lady Margaret Thatcher. Mr. Chairman, students of the Academy, parents and friends, I am very happy to be here to address the Academy on the third occasion. And as it's the first time that I have been the honorary advisor to the Academy, it gives me special pleasure to congratulate you on the great contribution you make to training young people, and particularly to tourism, and to communicating all that is best in Japan. A word especially to the students, 
the choice you've made to become a tourist guide is probably the most important decision you've had to make in your life until now. I remember full well how difficult it was to decide what sort of career one would have. You wanted to be certain that it would have a future. Most of us wanted to feel that we were doing something really good for our country and that we also wanted to be doing something not only with things but with contact with people. I think you have chosen a career which meets all of those three conditions. Some two years ago, I had to attend a very big conference on tourism in Hawaii. It was a very long way to go, and I wondered what I would find when I got there in a conference about tourism. When I arrived, I was amazed. The conference covered the whole region. There were thousands of people in one of the biggest arenas I have seen, all concerned with providing the many facilities of tourism. And as I had looked up all of the statistics and all of the facts before I got there, I began to learn a very great deal about it. At first, I had thought, now what is going to be the biggest industry in the world? What is going to be the biggest provider of jobs? The biggest single industry? Is it the manufacture of cars? Is it the manufacture of household goods? Is it the great banking services throughout the world? No. My friends, the biggest industry in the world and the biggest employer is tourism itself. Perhaps when you think about it, it is not quite so surprising because manufacturing has gone from employing a great many people to becoming totally automated and so it employs far fewer. That has meant the many service industries have had to take over the main task of providing jobs. Also, you live in a very different world from the one in which I was brought up. That world, there aren't many here who remember it, in the 30s, was a time when there was a very big recession in industry, much, much bigger than anything you are seeing now. And there was not a great deal of money about for any of the pleasures over and above the cost of ordinary, everyday life. So there was not very much traveling abroad. Indeed, very many people didn't have long holidays and couldn't take a holiday away from home. This whole industry has grown as the prosperity of the post-war period has developed, as we all, by producing more goods, have had a higher standard of life in our houses, a higher standard of living uh, in transport, and a higher standard of living in visiting other people and having them to visit us. And so now you find that tourism is the biggest industry in the world. It employs 127 million people. Now, there are only 120 million in Japan. So that gives you some idea of the numbers of people employed the world over. And don't forget that in your lifetime as well as in mine, only about half the world is truly free. A large part of the other part of the world, and some of it's next to you, your next door neighbors, China, Russia, the old Soviet Union, some of the countries of Southeast Asia, the Vietnams, the Cambodia, were not free did not have a high standard of living and were not able to travel. So the potential as they come up to a freer way of life because communism meant to produce better material standards by denying people all freedom and having everything planned produced neither a good standard of living 
nor any kind of dignity, nor human rights for their people. And as the very greatest event, political event, in my lifetime, was the collapse of communism in the Soviet Union, we have a great deal to look forward to as they get through the transition of coming through from a dictatorship to a free society. And they have a lot of resources. We have a great deal to look forward to in their improved standard of living and their traveling as they come to us and we go much more also to them and learn how they wish to live both in the interior of their country and some of their very interesting history, which you see both in Moscow and Leningrad. China is perhaps your very near neighbor, uh, of which you have such, uh, with which you have such a history. China, the most populous country in the world, is coming out of communism a different way. In Russia, Mr. Gorbachev had had no experience of trade at all, or of enterprise. The first time he'd ever seen the prosperity of Europe was when I asked him to visit Britain when I was Prime Minister. And he and Mrs. Gorbachev came for six days, and they saw a world they had never seen before. And somehow at the beginning, they couldn't understand that things hadn't been put into the shops just for their visit. And I said, no, but they're always there. You can go anywhere and see them. They saw a world of plenty. They saw a world of free debate. Now, they had no idea how to produce plenty because everything was planned and the people didn't matter. What Mr. Gorbachev did see, and what he did know, was that the rigid communism that they had in the Soviet Union, which had lasted for such a long time, had to change. That's why he called it perestroika. And his first way of change was to introduce freedom of worship, your beliefs, freedom of speech, freedom to debate, freedom to elect your representatives, uh, eventually to have different parties, Freedom to see for the first time, to see and hear what those people, the politicians, were debating about and not to have it totally behind closed doors. And he hoped that by doing that, the people would discuss and learn to come and know how to run business, how to run private business, how to develop capital and how gradually to build up a more prosperous society. So they came out of it the way of personal and political freedom, and they're having great difficulty in getting to an enterprise economy because no one has been allowed to use their initiative for 73 years. China, your nearer neighbor, Mr. Deng Xiaoping, had traveled the world, knew its prosperity, and wanted to introduce that into China, but did not want to let go of political control and command. So he started in 1978, and I remember him telling me on my first visit to China that he had begun by telling people in the factories, all of which were state-owned, every business was state-owned, if they produced more than their targets, they could in fact have that extra production and sell it where they could. Now this was the first time that we ever had any incentive in a communist society. Now as we all know, the Chinese, given an opportunity, are born traders. We know that in Hong Kong, British still a colony because we couldn't give it liberation because there is a lease on the land and the land has to go back to China in 1997. But it's very interesting that the same Chinese people, the same ethnic grouping, the same background, the same hereditary, the same culture, under British rule, or the important thing was a good professional civil service 
a very good rule of law with independent law courts and very good judges and an enterprise tradition, those same Chinese people could build one of the most successful economies in the world. Whereas the Chinese people trapped under communism had one of the most poverty stricken ways of life, both in materialism and no personal dignity, no personal rights, no rule of law. But they're coming out of it different ways. Your two neighbors, Russia coming out of it by personal freedom and hoping to get the enterprise, China coming out of it by getting the enterprise. And then I believe when they have got that, they will also want and gradually indeed are demanding much more political liberty. The world has never known, my friends, one country so big in population as China. It's going to be something entirely new. 1.2 billion people. And they're going to be prosperous. And so we want them to have as much respect for freedom, a rule of law, and eventually a parliamentary system as we have. I think one of the difficulties Japan has had over the years in this half century has been that you've been rather alone in this part of the world. You're the only democracy. You'd come to democracy. You've been a good example of democracy. And you were surrounded by people who were communist, which is of course a form of tyranny, with people with no human rights at all. That is going to change and you're going to have as much opportunity to receive people from Russia and from China as we have had in traveling to one another's countries in Europe and also across the Atlantic. Japan is still very expensive to come to. I don't refer to when you get here, which it is expensive, but it is the cost of getting here. But more and more people come, and more and more people come to do business and then stay for tourism. So you are in the tourist industry going to be able to look forward to a very much better prospect of seeing some of your near neighbors coming and seeing how you do things in Japan. Now what do they want to know about? I know that when people come to my own country, uh, Britain, England, what they first want to know about is the history of the country and all the historic things. You see, we each had our own history and culture long before there was travel. So the history of a country has been really the root of its culture and the history of a country will explain why people have grown up with certain beliefs, certain habits and customs, why their buildings are such as they are. And people I know coming to see us always want to know about our historic buildings and I'm often very anxious to show them the new things we have done. You will be the same. They'll want to know first about a monarchy. Now, we have a monarchy. I must say to you, I think it is far the best system to have a monarchy and then an elected parliament which chooses the prime minister or the prime minister is the leader of the biggest party. Now why do I say that? But many, many of your visitors will be American that have an elected president. I say I prefer the monarchy. The monarchy is always there. It does not interfere with politics. These days it's a constitutional monarchy and acts on the advice of the elected prime minister. But there's always the continuity of the monarchy. There's always the monarchy to be the center of the patriotism and feeling of the country when it wants to express it. And that is very important because the affection can go there and all the criticism can go to the politicians. And heaven knows I've had enough criticism in my life, although I've done quite a lot. And all the debating things. I want to know about that. I want to know about your parliament. Don't forget, my friends, only 95 countries in the world, and that's up very much. No, it's not quite 90, it's 90 yet countries in the world have come to democracy. 
The rest still haven't come to some kind of democracy. Democracy is governed by the people through electing their representatives and then being able to turn them out after a certain period of time and choose others. So they'll want to know about your parliament. They'll then want to know about the many beautiful things you have made. And Japan is rich in beautiful things. You really are. Uh, whether it's your traditional industries or whether it's your new ones. They'll also want to see those. They'll also want to know, let's say, how do you live? Now, Japan has a great deal again to teach the world. You, the, 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 the essence, what I would call the building brick of society, is the family. Now, there has been, unfortunately, quite a lot of family breakdown in Europe, and in America. In Japan, you still have the strongest system of the family. You still have, therefore, the very great influence of the parents on the children. You still have them teaching the children responsibility, self-improvement, self-reliance, the importance of hard work. My friends, never lose that. It is the single most important thing in the future of society. I had a very strong family. I tried to give my children a very strong family. And therefore, it is important. There's something else important, which I should perhaps say to you as young people. In, in um, some countries in Europe and in America, there are now about 31 children, out, 31 babies out of every 100, born to single parents. That is undermining the family because children have a right to two parents and to be brought up in the family. In Japan, it is only one out of every hundred. Again, you have the fantastic strength of the family. I think it is partly this that has been responsible for Japan having one of the lowest crime rates in the modern world. Very low. I know you suddenly had this cult. A cult, you get these strange cults in all societies. We had it in America with the Waco cult. You've had it here. Please do not let the existence of one or two cults undermine your belief in your free society and its future. You have the essence of keeping some of the things which the West has lost, the family life, the low crime, and may I say this too, this is the best way to keep that, is to continue the importance of the family and never, never get involved with drugs. Now I have to say this to young people, sometimes when you go to university you're tempted to try these things. Never do so. You cannot be yourself if you're yourself plus a drug. You can only take on the characteristics of a drug which will damage you for the rest of your life. And there wouldn't be people growing drugs unless there were people using them. They are the greatest danger. So I think in Japan you have this strong family, the low crime, very, very low use of drugs, if at all. That is one of the best things you can, in fact, uh, tell people about. Now, they want to know how people live and, of course, you'll be able to tell them your customs and traditions. May I say that one of the things they will acknowledge, not only acknowledge, but like very much, is a supreme courtesy, which, in fact, you have uh, in your country, and which tends to have been lost to the same extent in the West. What is courtesy? It's respect for one another. And so, we're going into a totally different period a period where you keep your traditions, but also have developed new products and have always welcomed new good ideas. Now, let's have a look at the new products you have developed, because there have been a certain amount of controversy about trade recently. The products have changed from the pre-war period to this post-war period. Of course they've changed because people can afford more and in building up successful industry, they've made more. Your cars, I must tell you, are quite outstanding in design and quality. Britain has every reason to be very grateful to Japan 
because you have invested heavily in our country. You did so while I was Prime Minister and I had to negotiate with the leaders of your industry. And we managed, believe it or not, in this world which is very open to the media, to keep it quiet for two years so that we could do our negotiations all behind the scenes. We then set up in a part of my country in the north and produce cars there, Nissan cars. They are excellent quality. The relationship between your management and our workforce is first class. I opened the factory and I went round to talk to our small workforce there and I was very interested in what they said because this again is part of the Japanese culture which you're not communicating enough. Not only have the history, not only do you have superb products and superb design, management is very good. One of the people on the shop floor said to me, um, Mrs. Thatcher, in this company, this Japanese company for which we work, everyone is given some responsibility. We are each responsible for seeing that what we do is well done. And we do that, it's not needed to be inspected because they trust us and they produce some of the very best quality goods and we now have Toyota as well. So you're taking Japanese culture, Japanese habits the world over by your investment. And gradually you will find that far, a far bigger proportion of tourists come to Japan. Now among them will of course be so many American tourists and as you know, as well as being a very, very good friend of Japan, I'm also one of America's uh, best friends. The world owes a great deal to America. It's different from any other country. You and I have a country founded on history, founded on our people, built up over the years. America, uh, which you know very well and which defends, defends you against any nuclear um, a weaponry getting elsewhere. America is the only country in the world founded upon an ideal. The ideal that everyone has certain fundamental human rights which no government is entitled to take away. These are the rights to life, liberty, the pursuit of your own talents and abilities within a general framework of law. It's the only country in the world founded upon that ideal and the only country which has that ideal in its constitution and didn't matter who you elected, they could never change that fundamental constitution which is protected by a Supreme Court. And so they're quite different from anyone else. They have built up the biggest, most powerful economy. Also because so many talented people have gone there, they have something else. They are leaders in fundamental science. They, and it so happens that we are very good too, in unlocking the secrets of the world in fundamental science. And you and America are leaders in applying that science into technology. They also are the leaders in defending other nations if a dictator tries to take them over. So let us always remember that when you get an attack in the post-Cold War world, we've had some more conflicts. Iraq tried to take over Kuwait. It was America and ourselves who said, the days of aggression are over. You are not going to take the land or territory of anyone else. You send your people, both in the air and on the ground, and I will send ours. It was America which kept the integrity of Kuwait. And gradually we built up a coalition of countries who were not able to contribute to it, so you contributed massively in finances for that. So we must always take into account that America is both the freest and the most powerful country in the world. And that in Asia Pacific, your part of the world, things are changing very, very rapidly indeed. I'm not sure whether you know that the three most successful nations are here, 
they, the three, I'm sorry, the three most powerful nations in the amounts that they are spending on weaponry are here. America, only used for defense, never for attack. Japan, only used for defense, you're also spending a good deal. And China, now China's a nuclear power. So there, there's a very, very important strategic interest in this region. And you are one of the main countries of it and also will be expected to give a lead. The other thing that's changing about the whole world is a change in prosperity of this region. During your lifetime and mine, the two economic, main economic centers have been America and Europe, with Japan coming up very successfully in industry and extremely successful. One of these, it was the three, one of these are the big three economic areas. That success is now extending to the whole of Asia Pacific. The success is, is coming because the democracy is coming. Southeast Asia, Malaysia, a democracy. Thailand, having difficulty, but a democracy. Singapore, a democracy. Indonesia, electing its president, coming up to more, towards a more fuller democracy. And with the free enterprise system, not decisions by the state, but more and more taken by the people. I don't know whether you look at the statistics. I won't necessarily bore you with them. But what is happening is there is now more trade between, say, Europe and Asia Pacific than there is with Europe and North America. So rapidly is business developing in this region. The average rate of growth is coming up to 9 or 10 percent a year. Not in Japan at the moment because your growth came before and you got a problem with the yen. But the growth in the region is the greatest growth anywhere in the world. 9 to 10 percent a year coming up very rapidly in China and in the other countries. And as Vietnam, now a country of 80 million, Vietnam starts to become freer and frees up, you'll get it there. The Philippines have become freer, you'll get the increasing trade there. And all through the region. This is going to be, and you are the, 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 the oldest country that has come to prosperity and democracy, this is going to be the richest region in the world and the most populous. You'll have about three and a half billion people here. China will be balanced by Southern Asia India not only has 900 million people, but she's ahead because she's a democracy. She's the biggest democracy in the world. But here in this region, which you are so well situated, is going to be the most prosperous region, the most populous region, and therefore the region is going to have greatest influence on the economy. Also have um, South Korea. You still, I'm afraid, got some outposts of communism, like North Korea, we have to be very, very much beware. And so you have tremendous opportunities by your experience, by your success, by your history, by your tradition. And being a country, and being a politician, and being a member of the international community is all very similar. You have to learn how to blend the best of your old traditions with the best of the new. That really is the whole aspect of politics, the whole aspect of life. Keep the old traditions, but blend them with the new. And that is what you will have to do in this part of the world. What are our hopes for the coming century? There has become a rule of politics. It's a rule by deduction from what has happened. Established democracies do not go to war or have conflict with one another. They're so busy getting a better standard of living for their people that they do not resort to conflict. It is only when a nation attacks a democracy that you get conflict and you get war and you have, in fact, to defend that very liberty that might otherwise never have managed to survive. So part of the objective in politics, and this is why we're so pleased about the collapse of communism, in Russia and, of course, uh, collapsing in China, about things going better in Cambodia, much better in Vietnam. Part of the whole strategy 
is to increase democracy. It doesn't suddenly change a country. Democracy has to have more than a vote. You have to have a strong rule of law, and you have to have a people willing to accept the responsibilities of freedom, and that takes a time to develop. But the strategy is gradually to get the whole world to establish democracy. It'll take a long time in places like Africa, which are very difficult, but then South Africa has come to democracy, so that's encouraging. That should reduce the possibility of a big conflict. We shall, I'm afraid, always get local conflicts as you get local dictators like Iraq, as you get some international terrorism like the Islam fanaticism. We shall always have that. But our objective is to have a world free of global conflict, to have a world freer to travel, which we shall have. The great change in electronics has meant that it's much easier for us all to communicate. We know what's going on elsewhere. We live truly in a kind of global village now, and that will change the whole way we think. All of this augurs very, very well to, for your young people who've chosen to become, who come to this academy, this very distinguished academy, and be guides. Their first contact as they come to Japan will be with the Hello Guide. They will judge their country and people by how you deal with them. And this is why this training is so vital, why I know it is so very good and so very thorough. And how you deal with them will be largely responsible for the first contact they have with Japan and how and what they will see. I myself have very great faith in your training. I hope now that you have a very great understanding of the better world which we hope to achieve and which, while you have been growing up, some of the politicians have in fact been achieving by bringing down the dictatorships and the communist system. So that the world of tomorrow, which you young people will be hoping and helping to build, will genuinely be a better world for the families that you will have and for all the people living in it. Each and every one of the six billion people different, an absolute miracle. Each of them with something to contribute if they have a free society, a democracy, a rule of law, and good government to do it in. That is our objective. It's a great vision. I hope we can build it together. Thank you very much. The first question is from Mr. Keiichiro Asao. It's been argued for quite some time that we need to reform the system that operates here in Japan. You have accomplished many reforms in your country. What was the key to success in introducing and successfully carrying out those reforms? I thank you very much. I think there are two aspects to the reforms. One is the reform of your democratic parliamentary system to make things work better. Because, of course, it's a totally new system to you. Whereas our first parliament assembled in the year 1265. And so, gradually it has been developing its customs since then. And it started because the then powerful people in our land lined up to the king and said, look, we're not going to supply you with the money you demand from us for your purposes and for keeping an army unless you redress certain grievances that we have. We want you to, to make some changes in the laws for us and we're not going to give you money until you've done that. And this is how our parliament began. And this is why we're always very conscious that we mustn't be taxed too much. Now, that parliamentary system grew up gradually, and it wasn't a few people that had the influence with the king, with the monarch, 
bigger and bigger and bigger until you had a universal franchise and a law passed that Parliament must be dissolved and re-elected every five years or a different one elected. Gradually the parties grew up and they changed very much at the end of the last century. With manufacturing, the early manufacturing was dirty, unpleasant, noisy, and the wages were low until we could, uh, the, the product would fetch more. And people thought that they should have a better deal, and they were right. And so a different party grew up, it was called the Labour Party, the Party of Labour, and you started trade unions. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. Everyone wants to have a better deal. Everyone wants to have a fair wage, provided you can sell the product at that rate of pay, or you can get greater productivity, which cuts down unit costs. But in our country, we were to some extent affected by the socialist system. And into the Labour Party there came something very similar to the communist doctrine. All industries, services, should be nationalised and that the whole economy should be run by what was called the nationalization, taking over by the state, of the means of production, all distribution, all transport systems, and distribution retail systems, and exchange, that's finance. Everything under the control of the state. And some people sold socialism to the Labour Party. Now you've seen that socialism in its extreme form in communism has collapsed. Nationalized industries were not working well. I will tell you why. The moment they were nationalized, they knew they could never go bankrupt. And frankly, they were not efficient. They didn't make enough money for investment, so they came to the taxpayer to provide the investment. And I had to agree with the chairman of nationalized industries each year. We only had 45 nationalized industries, but that was a lot because they were big industries, steel was nationalized, coal was nationalized, electricity was nationalized, telephone communications were nationalized. Um, and I said, look, this, this isn't right. You are demanding money for investment, which you, you should supply from your efficiency and from your, your prices. And the more I give to you, the less I can give to education, the less I can give to health, the less I can give to looking after old people. Now, I'm going to denationalize you. We're going to privatize you. Of course, I knew full well that everyone who worked for those industries wouldn't necessarily want to be privatized. Some did, because they knew it would be better. And we dealt with that by this way. Everyone in those industries who had to leave because they were grossly overmanned, you could get the same output, usually with half the number of people that they were employing. So the half have had to go. But I wasn't going to have any suggestion that we were not interested in their future. We were. So I arranged, instead of their annual subsidy, that to each and every person who left, they got a very good um, redundancy payment, a little sum of capital. I'll give it to you in dollars. $1,500 for every year they had worked in that industry. So if they worked in that industry for 10 years, uh, they got $15,000. If they worked in it for 20 or 30, they got even more. So they got a capital sum. And then we sold off the industry to shareholders through the mechanism of the stock exchange market. Now, it was difficult at first, but we did it. Uh, how did we do the reforms on taxation? Now, I must say to my friends, be very wary of high taxes. Any government that has high taxation is giving itself more powers and the people less. When I came into office, the, the top tax on earned income, on earnings, was, now listen, 
83%. The top tax on savings was 98%. No wonder our economy was collapsing. I took down the top tax from 83%, first down to 60 and then now down to 40%. It's been for a long time. Top tax on savings, similarly, right down to 40%. There was some incentive. And of course, the lower rates of tax are much lower, and there are reliefs for earning your own house. Now, this was, was quite popular, except that we had to put on an increased tax, a sales tax. But I thought it better, we did not put a sales tax on essentials. There's no sales tax on food, on children's clothing on public transport, on electricity or gas. Uh, these things, uh, the newspapers and books, uh, and the health and services they were, were, were totally free of tax. They really were fundamental essentials. The taxes went more highly on the other things. And we got that through. And our economy began to bloom. It was worthwhile being efficient. And something else. Any industry under socialists that had come into difficulty simply came to the government for a subsidy to keep it going. I said, no, you're free enterprise. We will give you a framework of law. Freedom, my friends, has never been unfettered, nor has the marketplace. You've always had to have honest weights and measures from the beginning of time. You've always had to have more, more and more safety of goods and so with more and more chemicals, you have to watch that uh, uh, bad chemicals are not introduced into food and so on. All of these things we did. The, the task of government is to have a framework of law and basic conditions between employer and employee. And then you say, now you know what to produce, you get on with it. All of these things we did. And it was so successful that I never lost an election. Now. The other reform that you have to have, and I'm coming to the end, but I have to explain it. You have not yet got your parties sorted out. See, with the collapse of communism, there's nothing like so much difference between the parties. No respectable party will say we want more and more state control, because that means less and less power to the people. And so there's less difference between the parties, but there must be a clear philosophy, clear principles, clear beliefs, and you must say what they are, from which clear policies flow, and you must give the broad outline of the policies, and clear action when you're in power. So there's a, a considerable difference between ourselves. I did these policies. The policies I've described to you were ones left to me by the Labour Socialist Party. So there was a clear difference. Never get too many parties, because that will blur the difference in philosophy and the, the lines of action. I think you're, uh, you need to reform your political system, but don't get too many parties. And I would say to you, I don't like coalitions. It reduces the people's choice, uh, and that is wrong. Um, I prefer clear principles and policies to consensus. My way is not to say, now let's all get around and decide what we shall do, which tends to be the Japanese way. It may be changing. My way is to say, this I believe. Yes, I believe that the main wealth production should come through free enterprise. I believe in freedom under a rule of law, because you can't have freedom without it, administered independently. I believe in a market economy. The marketplace is the oldest form of exchange known to man. You not only bought and sold goods, but it was a great social occasion. All the families went, they met other families. Uh, and private property. Must have private property. And, and a sound financial system and sound defense. That is the task of government and also educational opportunity. Those are the tasks of government and the wealth creating is to be left to the people. So I would say this is what I believe. These are the policies which I intend to introduce. We need improvements in education and so on. Put them in a manifesto and people knew where they were. So I wasn't asking for consensus. I was asking them to agree to what I believed in and they had faith that I'd put it into practice. Now that's a very big answer. 
But you're coming along, you're coming the right way. You've got the free enterprise, you'll get the reforms, but do have a clear choice for the people. Thank you for asking the question. The next question is from Ms. Mami Hijikata. Uh, life is a series of options, and when you choose one course of action, that means giving up another. What was the most difficult decision you ever made, and how did you justify it? Well, I've told you that the basic changes I had to make were basic changes from what I call a conservative philosophy, which is keeping the best and improving the rest. Uh, and the socialist. But when it came to government, the most difficult decisions that you have to make tend to be in what we call international or foreign affairs. And they're difficult because sometimes it may mean putting your people into battle. It did during my time. And the most uh, difficult one, but one which had to be made very quickly, was when the Falkland Islands 8,000 miles away, right diagonally from us, we're, 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 we're right, if you're looking at your part, we're right up here in the North Atlantic. The Falklands were diagonally right down here, just off the tip of South America. Um, and the British people had been there for over 150 years. There were no Argentinians on the islands except the ones running an air service to the mainland. All of a sudden, the military dictatorship in Argentina invaded. Now, I was told three days before they invaded that their fleet had sailed and that this time people thought it might not be merely an exercise, which it usually was, because of some of the things that they had loaded on the, the dockside that it may be this time they're going to invade. If they were going to invade, they'd have to they'd invade on the Friday morning. It would take that length of time. And I remember saying to my, I called my military advisors and top politicians together, members of the cabinet, saying, if the Argentinians invade those islands, we have got to get them back. We have got to free the land and our people because the people farm the land, it's their land, and they want our way of life, not to live under a military dictatorship. It is very interesting, the advice I received, some from the military, there's no way, Mrs. Thatcher, in which we can retake those islands. They're 8,000 miles away. It's the winter in the Antarctic. Um, the winds over the waves are terrible. The storms are terrible. We have no air cover except what we can provide from an aircraft carrier. The deck of the aircraft carrier will be going up and down like that. It'll be difficult to take off and land. Uh, the the uh, soldiers you'll have to put on board will have been bouncing about on the ocean, be seasick before they have to land. We can only put three or four thousand on. They've already got ten thousand on the islands. We can't do it. Uh, and some politicians took that view. And I said, I'm sorry. If the Argentinians invade those islands, we have got to retake them. Now we spent a great deal of money, because it's my philosophy of politics that the unexpected will happen, and you'd better be prepared for it. Now, when it happens, it's too late to prepare. So we, a different history, have always kept strong defense forces and always the latest technology. It paid off. I had strong, well-equipped, well-trained, high-grade armed forces. We had developed a vertical take-off plane. We couldn't have done it, the Harrier. Unless those planes could have taken off that way and have come down that way, we couldn't have fought the Argentinians with all of their airfields only 400 miles away. And I relied on the effectiveness of our soldiers being better than theirs. And so, had I fed all the information into a computer, as I suppose one might be tempted to do, the answer would have come out, for heaven's sake, don't go. You can't win. But what gives you, in the end, 
the victory <clears throat> is a spirit of a free people, provided the government has seen that they have the best equipment and are properly trained. And I said I had a small emergency committee. I didn't want too many people on it. There are five of us, the chiefs of staff, five politicians and the chiefs of staff and, and our lawyer. We met once or twice a day and I said to my chiefs, military chiefs of staff, anything you want, if we've got it, you can have it. If we haven't got it and you need it, we'll try to get it. And there were one or two things that we needed which we bought from the Americans. Now, the decision that we had to go, I did not find difficult to take. The agony when I had taken it, of waiting three to four weeks before they could land, the difficulties they encountered, every single death lay on my mind. Every time someone came up from my office with a piece of paper to my study or to my private flat or the telephone went, immediately you thought it was some new tragedy. Your mind was dominated for three months by the dangers they were in. We lost 257 members of our armed forces in freeing up those islands. We defeated the whole of the Argentine Navy, the whole of the Air Force, and the whole of their army with a few high-quality people. I felt everyone, and when I met afterwards the parents of all those who'd lost their sons, incidentally, we did it. There were only three deaths among the Falkland Islanders. We were very careful. I shall never forget what one mother said to me at the memorial service. She said, you'll never give those islands up again, will you? I said, no, never. Your son has died for it. The people are free. And so when I hear the Argentine, who has very little, practically no claim to those islands, staking a claim, I get very angry indeed, because that is naked ambition. It has nothing to do with the continuity of the people who farm those islands loyally and well well over 150 years. It was made similarly when we went to the Gulf, George Bush and I were together. We had to go. A third very difficult one was when I had a telephone call from President Reagan to say, look, Libya has become a total terrorist state. They're putting bombs on aircraft, they're putting bombs in them, in airport lounges, they're, they're practicing terrorism. You know what it's like. You just had an experience. And if we don't do something, they'll go on doing it. You remember some people got on a ship called the Achille Loro, took it over and pushed overboard a man who tried to oppose them in a wheelchair. He said, if we don't do something and strike, they'll go on. They'll think that they're free to practice international terrorism. And he said, I want to do a raid and I want to do it from your country, from mine. Can we have the use of your air bases and all that we need? I said, look, can, can just give me 24 hours uh, to consult one or two people. Um, I just want to know, will you tell me, there'll only be military objectives. I don't want any civilian objectives because we're going for the government. We're going for the military, uh, the bombs and, and so on, and they had um, a certain amount of chemical weapons. Yes, they next day assured me there would only be military objectives. I couldn't discuss it with many people. It would have leaked. Sometimes I think rooms have ears, and they have. So I was only able to discuss it with two other people, my defense secretary and my foreign secretary. And we decided, yes, the raid was legitimate. It had a reasonable purpose. And that actually was the most difficult decision because we had, in fact, to defend it to Parliament, but it was justified. For a long time, we were free of that international terrorism from Libya. That was the most difficult one. But any involving conflict are difficult. But unless people had taken the decision I did, liberty would have died in the world. And instead of having half tyranny, as we had at the end of World War II, uh, the, 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 the communists and the dictators would have won. So they were the right decisions, but difficult. Thank you.
The next question is from Mr. Noriaki Saito. Do you think that Japan and Japanese culture are being effectively introduced to your country? If not, what can we do about it? Well, as I indicated, we are fortunate in having some of your industries and some of your management over with us. Um, and, I know, and some of your uh, financial banks come also to London, which is a great banking centre. So we see quite a number of your people, and they are very, very good ambassadors, in inverted commas, for your country. They're very conscientious, they take part in uh, all our voluntary efforts, if we want to raise money, extra money for a hospital or something like that. And they're very good, and their children go to our school and are extremely good. We know some of your culture because there was a magnificent exhibition in our Royal Society of Arts in about 1981 or 82, and all your most precious things came over. The most lovely ceramics, the most lovely paintings, the most beautiful screens, uh, absolutely the most beautiful lacquer, everything. And it was full every day, that exhibition. But I think perhaps we don't know, you don't put across enough that family life is still strong in Japan, that education is still most highly thought of, and that the children uh, have to work. We do know that you train three times the number of mathematicians and engineers proportionately to what we do. So we do know some, but I think we also ought to know more that you've kept this family life, because it is most important that your courtesy is outstanding. And courtesy, of course, is consideration for other people. So I am anxious to get more tourism of people coming to Japan, so we might know more and more of your beauty, of your traditions, of your lovely things, we know, of the importance of family life, the importance of education, um, and uh, that those are the, and, and the, the, the low crime rate. We ought to know, because you see, otherwise the bad things get out. This terrible cult get out and people think, oh, you always get the bad news on television. You want more of the good news. Because I say that anyone can have a cult. We've had terrorism for, for 25 years and we've learned to fight it. And then you had this terrible earthquake. And in a strange way, can I say it, that there's more understanding and sympathy with Japan as a result of that terrible earthquake and of the action you've taken over this dreadful cult, which isn't a religious cult at all, it's sheer crime. We have much more understanding and sympathy. So yes, you're coming up in the eyes of the world. And a little more good news on television would be a good thing. Right, thank you. Obnai, please. Both Britain and Japan have a royal family, but I think British royalty is much more open and accessible to the public. So what does the royal family mean to the people of your country? Well, it means that the Queen is the head of the Constitution. What it means constitutionally is the continuity of the Queen king or queen, and the monarchy, and that no prime minister or government can take over unless they have been constitutionally and properly elected. Because the queen would not call a prime minister to lead the government, and he has to be called by the queen, unless he'd been properly elected or observed the rules by which he has to be put forward. So it is the ultimate defense against unconstitutional action. All our members of the royal family are extremely active and busy in getting round to the public, and going and seeing the schools, the hospitals, the armed services, uh, going to a, a open, a new housing blocks, new office blocks, going to a special visits to towns on their centenary or a special anniversary. All of them have a very busy program so that their personalities mean something to the public. And uh, that is, you, um, 
you see, whenever you have a royal occasion, each year Parliament, the session of Parliament is reopened by the Queen in full regalia. You must keep the traditions in full reception. Every time we have a state visit, it's full regalia and full uh, 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 ceremonial drive through the streets. Do keep the old traditions alive, but the monarchy has changed very much. It is always about, as you say, meeting the people, and they're all very greatly in demand. And our Queen Mother is, was born the year of the century, 94. She is, and she's still carrying out public engagements, and we all adore her. Right, thank you. Mr. Nishimura, please. Lady Thatcher, um, trade infection seems to be increasing throughout the world. And do you think free market principles and laissez-faire work well? Now, we have got the GATT and we have now got the World Trade Organization. They have not yet got to free trade. Their purpose was the greater freeing up of trade. What has happened recently is that um, there has been an increased amount of protectionism. Now, agriculture has always been protected. Sometimes it's protected too much, so we put agriculture under the World Trade Organization to see if we can get some of the protection down. Because if we produce all of our own agricultural things, the third world doesn't have any market for their products. If they can't sell us things, they can't buy things from us in the manufacturing way. Europe has gone very protectionist because there is really an error, a purposeful error, in the trade uh, legislation, uh, the international trade legislation. You can build a customs union and have free trade within, but protectionism from without, which is the old mercantilist doctrine. And I'm afraid Europe's gone protectionist. America has some protectionism, though she's freer. And Japan has some protectionism by habits and by culture and by the fact that her distribution system leaves a lot to be desired. Now, the important thing is that we try to go to free uh, trade. We pulled ourselves up, America, Britain, Europe, Japan, by being able to sell our goods freely into the world markets. We cannot expect to have ourselves what we then deny to others. Life is a reciprocal business. You don't all take, you give and you take. And what you take, you give. And that is the battle to do it at a rate which we can change the habits and customs and to accept. Now, I don't like it when either America or Japan or Britain, because America and we are perhaps the greatest defenders of liberty and Japan is one of the, one of the great economic centers of the world. Um, we three have to get on, particularly with the new power in Asia Pacific. And I don't like it when these threats are made. I really don't. But if there is a valid complaint, then the action is steadily to deal with it. Not suddenly, but to deal with it. You'll see, we will deal with it over a period of four or five or five to ten years. But do not deal with it with quotas. Because if you have two countries having a quota, it cuts out all the others. And we want the trade highways of the world to be free. So I don't like the, 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 the shouting and the alarm. It's not the way to solve problems, but I do hope it will be solved. And if there's legitimate complaint on either side, then we've got to deal with it. But we must go to free trade. Incidentally, you say laissez-faire. Free enterprise is not laissez-faire. Free enterprise is free enterprise within a framework of law which law is maintained, the weights and measures, the sanctity of contract, the safety of goods and services, the safety of transport, the chemical safety, etc., and so on. Right? Aye. But free of trade must be the objective and we must work steadily towards it. Right. The last question is from Ms. Mariko Tsuzaki. This is a rather private question, but if you don't mind, would you tell us how you spend your leisure time and how you keep fit? <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, I don't have much leisure because I like work. <laughs> <laughs> but when I do, both my husband and I love listening to really wonderful music. And of course, the recordings of music now are infinitely better than they used to be. It's the new electronics. We would like also to go to opera and theater, just very occasionally, but because it's occasional, it's a very great treat. And we read and we read and we read. So do the people of Japan. So we have even more in common. Thank you. Finally, Mr. Wayama would like to present Lady Thatcher with a bouquet of flowers and a commemorative gift as expressions of our deepest gratitude.